Hello there. Welcome tonight to our Bible study. Looks like my mic's a little hot there. I'll turn it down. Several I've seen have checked in already. I see uh, Marlon Beck. Joy and peace to all. Shirley Newber, good evening. Fred and Becky send greetings. Robin Schmidt, good evening, everyone. Paul and Luann are watching. Mary Schneider, I am watching. Good to have you all with us tonight. We're in another Old Testament book, the prophet Jeremiah. Jan and Keith are watching. I think their comment will show up in the video here. There it is. Yeah, we're in the prophet Jeremiah tonight. Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah is often uh, called the weeping prophet uh, because he weeps for, for Israel and her rebellion and what's going to happen to her. Uh, actually, for Judah, he's... He's, um, yes, Mary, good to have you all with us tonight. Um, so he's in the southern part of Israel, we'll, in that area called Judah, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Tonight's Old Testament passage uh, is paired with Luke's gospel, that's the gospel we're using this year, Luke's version of what we call often the Sermon on the Mount. Or though in Luke, it's a, a, on a level place. He comes down and he stands on a level place and he speaks to the people. And it's uh, d different than the more familiar Matthew's gospel. We'll maybe look at that a little bit tonight as well. That will be our gospel lesson for Sunday. But I was really drawn to the Old Testament lesson for a lot of different reasons. So we'll look at, at the book of Jeremiah tonight. Good to have Mike and Charlotte with us. It's great that people from far away can be joining us and we can all be together. And uh, modern miracle of uh, technology like this. Um, Sunday we'll be having a video uh, that will be shared. Not a very long video, about six, seven minutes, sharing the work of the Board of Christian Education. And uh, we'll be having uh, cupcakes and things after the candy after the 10 o'clock service. Normally, we've been having, years past, we would have a Valentine's uh, dinner banquet with uh, fried chicken and all the, the fixings. And it was a great get-together of the church. And all the money that was given as a donation went to support the Board of Christian Ed. And I'm, I'm hoping, praying next year we'll get to do that. I know um, our new council president, Mike Lynn, he really would like to work towards um, developing ways for us to get together. That's so important, uh, that fellowship. And as things are opening up, it was just in the news that a lot of states are dropping their mask mandates and there's a, a movement towards getting, and the, the, the numbers are really going down. I pray that continues in that way and that uh, it really is the case that perhaps this will turn into something more manageable and we'll be able to have those times to gather again. But this Sunday we're not doing that. We didn't know how things would be going and uh, err on the side of caution. But we will be showing this video and taking up an offering and thinking about uh, what the Board of Christian Ed does. And as we'll talk tonight about Jeremiah, he talks about the blessing of trusting in God. So I'm working on my sermon, uh, The Blessing of Faith, and thinking about what we're giving our children especially, but, but also the adult Sunday school classes included in uh, what is done in the Board of Christian Ed, the strengthening of people's faith. But tonight we'll uh, especially look at the wider context of the book of Jeremiah. As we do, a lot of people to pray for, we've mentioned them on Sunday, a lot of people with dealing with cancers, um, a lot of people. Pray especially for Mary Ann Beck. Mary Ann had um, her first round of chemo treatments yesterday. It was, she was there eight hours, I believe, or more, getting those treatments. And as I am shared Sunday, this cancer is shown itself to be aggressive, and they're using a very aggressive type of treatment, some very harsh ones. So be praying for Mary Ann. Also, their, their grandson, Jonathan, He'll be now flying back uh, tomorrow 
to go to the South Sudan. So pray for him, Jonathan, a Marine. And our son Marcus did make it to Fort Sill, and he settled in, and he's uh, beginning his routine there in his bollock training or whatever it is that they call it. It's for those who are being trained. He's a second lieutenant in the National Guard, so we'll pray for him as well. But for all the people who are dealing with cancers, especially, and some with COVID, but they all seem to be doing doing well that I'm aware of. So would you bow them as we pray? Lord, we thank you for the, the wonderful change in weather. Last week I was looking at the slides, and I had a slide, and it was 24 degrees, and there was uh, all that snow on the ground. Well, actually, beginning with uh, freezing rain, and then sleet, and then snow. And we thank you for the, the warm weather we've enjoyed in the 50s, and now today in the 40s, tomorrow in the 50s again, and uh, a, a real opportunity for that to all melt. Thank you that people were able to come to church, those who ventured out on Sunday, and no one slipped and fell, and everyone was kept safe. But we thank you that even if we're separated by the miles, we can be together like this as a church family, as people gathered around your word, which brings us this gift of knowing and trusting you and living from that relationship with you. And thank you for tonight's passage, which reminds us of the blessing of faith. What faith, which is really coming to trust and know you, gives us and does for us. And thank you that that is a a solid rock upon which we stand in the midst of trial. And we thank you that that is a solid rock for Mary Ann. She's going through these treatments. And we thank you for all the people that we're praying for, that is, if they turn to you, they can know you as that strength. And you will be sufficient for them to, to for the moment that they're dealing with them, for that promise that we can rely on. For these young men who are in the military, we pray that they would turn to you and know you as their strength. And uh, for the young people of our church, especially, but also the adult Sunday school class and all the work of the Board of Christian Ed, we pray your blessing on it, Lord, that you would use it as a means of inculcating trust in you, that uh, we might pass on this great gift of, of faith. And thank you that you're getting us through this difficult time for churches, especially as uh, people are not coming to church for, for their own safety, for other reasons, uh, the weather being one. But And uh, it's been a great strain on uh, so much of, of the American church and probably churches around the world. Thank you that we've been doing all right here at Salem. We've been navigating it. We pray that you would help churches to do that to get us to that other side. And we look forward to that day when uh, we'll be able to return to uh, those gatherings together and being a church body in that togetherness. But thank you that we can be here virtually together. And we look forward to the study of your word, for we know your word never returns empty. And we receive this opportunity now tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Good to have my mother-in-law with us, Anna West, as we're on Jeremiah 17. In the Old Testament, if you turn there in your Bible, I'll just bring up again this. I like these overviews from the Open Bible. They give a good general overview of things. If you see on the screen there, and I think I've got it fairly big. I can make it a little bit bigger probably. Um, at the top it says, Focus. And then it says, Call of Jeremiah is the beginning of the book. And uh, you might be familiar with that, that opening of Jeremiah. It's a very uh, powerful image of God's calling Jeremiah. And uh, as you look at the book and all that he had to do and what he had to say and the opposition he would face, uh, he needed to know that God was with him. And so um, he says to Jeremiah those awesome words at the very beginning, chapter 1, verse 5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. And he would need to have that assurance for what he was going to do. Because if you see right after the call to Jeremiah, there's the prophecies to Judah. Jeremiah's ministry was to the southern part of Israel, the northern kingdom uh, of ten tribes, 
they were called Israel when there was a division. Again, like in the United States, the North was called the Union, the South, the Confederate States, and uh, very similar to our split between North and South. You had the, you, the three united kings were Saul, David, and Solomon, and it was uh, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, that basically brings about the split between the North and the South when he um, doesn't listen to the older, wiser people, but he listens to his younger friends, and he, uh, he says, you think my dad was tough on you, I'm going to be tougher, and the people rebel against him, against the counsel of the older people who said, you want, to, you want these people to like you, to not you want that you want that make them you know realize your your uh your caring for them and get them to be on your side and he didn't do that so they split and after that there are the two the two kingdoms the northern kingdom by the time of jeremiah and that's the next slide actually if you see on this slide at the very beginning it says 722 Israel's fall to Assyria. That's the northern kingdom. And that Assyrian empire, which we associate with Nineveh, the people in the story of Jonah, they're the ones that, that uh, bring the people out of the land and into exile. But Judah withstands it, does not get carried away. And it's during that time of the 600, see 628 there, Jeremiah is called to be a prophet. And at the bottom of this one, it says 627 to 580 is the time frame of this. But look at his prophecies then to that southern kingdom. The southern kingdom is existing, knowing that the kingdom north of them, Israel, their brothers from the other tribes of Israel, have been carried off by Assyria. They're down here in Judah. One of the false illusions that they're holding on to, good to have Dana with us tonight, um, they're holding on to illusion. Well, the reason why we didn't fall, like I see Lori Shaw Schmidt and uh, Janet Walder over there at P Pastor David Peterson. So good to have them with us over there. Um, they're holding on to the illusion that because they have Jerusalem and they have the temple, well, God's not going to let his own house be desecrated by foreign armies. And one of the things that... Um, Jeremiah is going to say, "Is that you're just that's a false illusion? Uh, uh, that's not true. You know, God is not going to save you from judgment because you have the temple." So his prophecies to Judah from two, all the way up to chapter forty-six. And so our chapter tonight. Good to have uh, Barb Ryman and Karen Owens with us tonight. Um, chapter seventeen is right in the heart of this time, and you see where it says underneath there, it gives the the various. Uh, things that Jeremiah is doing here. And then it says, before the fall. Our, our text for tonight is set before Jerusalem is going to fall to the Babylonians. That's the next kingdom that comes after the Assyrians. And so, Jeremiah, the context is really this, that Jeremiah is speaking to people who, who don't believe it's going to happen. And he's not a popular prophet when he when he gives his he's going to give a scroll and the king's going to burn it up uh he he has lots of very bad things happen to him he's thrown down into a well i mean it's uh, uh he's a he's a prophet who is not uh well the prophets of israel who were true prophets usually weren't well received and and loved because they were saying things that were not popular which is a sign oftentimes that you are a true prophet and uh, the sign is, if you're saying things that really everyone's saying, uh, you know, good about you, that's one of the things when Jesus will say, woe to you when everyone speaks well of you. And he was, so, you know, that's how they, they talk about the false prophets. When, you, when you're not saying things that people don't want to hear, that's usually a sign that uh, you're not speaking a, a transcendent word, a word that transcends our local circumstances and says something um, from God rather than just a, a parroting back what we want to hear. And so the context here in Jeremiah 17 is uh, 
is this background of they're going to be okay uh, and that Jeremiah is is wrong for his um, for his uh, warnings. So we pick up in verse 5 before our reading tonight. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. I want to read just a little bit from one of my commentaries here. This is the teacher's commentary, and again, it gives the background to this. The dominant theme of Jeremiah is that of national sinfulness and looming judgment. And so here we're, he's saying, cursed is the one whose trust is in man. We're going to find out in just a minute. Jeremiah's 40-year ministry spanned the final days of Judah's existence as an independent nation. He constantly warned his nation to submit to Babylon, a nation which God had appointed to discipline his people. As a result, he was hated as a traitor to his people. Jeremiah was, and his life was often threatened. Good to have my, my brother-in-law with me tonight, with us, Chuck Van Etten from the Great White North. <laughs> yes, yes, good to have him with us tonight. Um, and so, Jeremiah did live to see his, his words come true. He was often called the weeping prophet because of the personal anguish he knew in his ministry, witnessed the utter destruction of Jerusalem and of the temple that he, like other godly Jews, loved. Imagine seeing, for us Americans, I guess it would be the equivalent of seeing the destruction of the Capitol and the White House and the monuments in D.C., you know. What, what represents, you know, our national consciousness more than that area of Washington, D.C., with all those historic buildings. And, uh, and whenever you, some, sometimes you'll have these movies that are like um, super cataclysmic movies, and uh, a symbol of America will be there destroyed, and it's often the White House, or, or the, and, and I, I, in many ways, the destruction of the Twin Towers was like that. Had it, had it made, uh, you know, that one flight that felt that they were able to bring it down in Pennsylvania, had it made it to the Capitol, or, or I can't remember if that was exactly where it was headed, but it was one of those Washington places. Um, that's just a powerful thing, and Jeremiah lived to see all that come true. Um, here's another, uh, just a quick outline of the book that I thought was helpful. Um, the beginning of the book, Jeremiah's mission, it gets laid out. And then chapters 11 through 20, that's the chapters we're in, the broken covenant. And we just began reading the source of this broken covenant is that they're putting their trust not in God ultimately, but in human beings. And so, um, and the chapters after the reading for today, it's judgment nears, then there's promises of a new covenant. Jerusalem fallen, which is the climactic moment, and then the historical appendix. All right, back to some uh, of this other reading again. On the one hand, Jeremiah is difficult to outline because the book is an anthology of sermons delivered during the rule of various kings of Judah. To teach the book, it is probably best to take the approach adopted here to look at the sermons delivered under each king. And I wanted to get to that because our reading for today is actually delivered, it's a little bit out of sequence, but it's delivered during a time when, um, let me find it here. I gotta get it to scroll and it's taking its own sweet time. Under Jehoiakim. And um, here's the background to Jehoiakim the king. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim's reign, Nebuchadnezzar defeated the Egyptians in the battle of Carchemish. This firmly established the Babylonians as the dominant world power. Um, 
Jeremiah predicted a great captivity which would last 70 years. He's the one who says that they're going to actually be carried off by King Nebuchadnezzar. And we all know about Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This, th those are the ones who are carried into Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. And Jeremiah predicts it's going to be 70 years. And Jeremiah made a written record of these sermons that he gave. And King Jehoiakim ordered the scroll burnt and commanded the arrest of the prophet. And even under arrest, he continues to um, utter these prophecies. Well, this particular reading for today, where we started off by saying, Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. He's referring to the fact that Israel had been looking to Egypt as the one who would s deliver them from this coming of Nebuchadnezzar. And as I just read it, it, it fails. Um, Here's from a, a book called Sermon Studies. Uh, they turned away from God and placed their hope in weak and sinful man. Judah's attempt to enlist the aid of Egypt in their struggle against the Babylonians was just one example of their dependence on flesh, their dependence on human ability, human ingenuity, um, I'm going to do it my, in my own strength kind of a thing here. And it's just one example of, of many ways. As I was studying this, as various um, commentators were talking about how does this apply to modern day life, they said this is still very much, of course, the temptation that, that we, we build our lives on all these things that we've developed and we put our hope in them is the temptation in and, and human technology, the human ability to... Um, to uh, secure our lives. Uh, and then, when do people oftentimes turn to God? It's when those things fail them, right? Uh, I do remember very, very distinctly, I was pastor here in 2001 when uh, the Twin Towers were attacked. And I remember very much um, how the churches began to fill up at that time because it awakened people to the fact that what we had, people had become kind of just assuming, and that is we're, we're apart from all that craziness that goes on in other parts of the world, and we are secure. We have secured ourselves. We ourselves, we have this mighty army. We have uh, a mighty economy. We have uh, made our lives safe. And then when this happens, that illusion crashed down, and that was a great example of Woe to you who put your trust in that. You're, everything's going to fall apart. I mean, the, um, it's similar to what Jesus said when he said, uh, the one who, at the end of Matthew's version of the Sermon on the Mount, the one who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice will be like a person who built their house on the rock. Uh, but the one who doesn't do it, they'll be like their, the person who built their house on the sand. And you could see that in the faces of many people that uh, their world began to, to fall apart. Uh, their their concept of their sense of security. I think similarly when uh, we had the, the crash in like 2008, it really shocked a lot of people. And then with the virus and uh, all that went on with that, these are wake-up calls. And then personally, when people go through a health crisis, uh, they awaken to the fact that I'm a mortal. Uh, I'm a human being. And... Uh, Everything that I base my trust in can suddenly be taken from me in, in a matter of, of moments. And uh, when, when it says, cursed is the one who trusts in man, we're not talking about an arbitrary thing. We're talking about it's absolutely true that if that's all you're putting your trust in, is in a mere mortal, which can be taken from you in a moment, you're cursed. You, you don't have much that's holding your life together and it can be taken it can be taken from a, from you in just in a moment and uh, he introduces a word in verse 5 that's going to become key later on whose heart turns away from the lord now i mentioned this before for the hebrews uh, we're going to be thinking about valentine's day of course coming up and for us the heart symbolizes especially 
love, and the emotions. For the Hebrews, the heart included the emotions, but it was the whole inner life of a person, their desires, their will, their intellect, their entire inner self. It was everything up in, inwardly about them, their orientation of their, their inner, inner person, where, where they put their life's focus. And this heart is a, is a key thing for Jeremiah, that uh, as it will be for Jesus. You know, when you get to the Gospels, Jesus will say, it's not that what that goes into a man that defiles him, it's what comes out of a man, for out of the heart, out of the inner direction of that person's life, that person speaks. And uh, when Jesus is doing that, he's echoing this long tradition all the way back to the prophets like Jeremiah, of focusing in on the heart. Continuing on, verse 6, that person, this one who trusts in man, will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. He's actually referencing, uh, there's a word there that's not translated, or it's not, it's not brought into our NIV text, but it's there, the word Araba. Some other translations will actually keep that word, that original word there. And that place, Araba, is right here under the Dead Sea. You can see it right there. Uh, that area, just read a little bit about it, that he's referencing here, would have been in their minds. They would have known. Desert, the Araba, an area in Israel that comprises the area s- south of the Dead Sea, extending toward the head of the Gulf of Agaba, most of this region lies below sea level, and thus it is a depression that lies between two sections of higher ground. Salt land refers to land that is completely barren, such as what is found in the vicinity of the Dead Sea. Land whose level of salinity is high is useless for agriculture, which conjures up memories of Sodom and Gomorrah, in their minds, you know, that, and... Um, In the Tigris-Euphrates region, a process of progressive salinity took place between the 3rd and 2nd millennium BC. This meant that as time went on, the percentage of salinity in the vicinity of the Persian Gulf was so great that the soil was no longer suitable for agriculture and had to be abandoned. And this is what uh, Jeremiah is referencing here, that the person um, who's drawing strength, so to speak, from something other than God, they're going to be like someone who is in this dry area. That they're, they're, they're not getting their, their needs met. This should sound very familiar. Let's turn to the next verse. And, and if, if you know anything about the Psalms, you're going to see that this sounds very familiar to one of the Psalms. Verse 7. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Now, what's very interesting and what several have pointed out here is that it, it, like Jesus, when he talks about the man who builds his life on the rock, he says, and then the winds and the waves come. Great reminder that Jesus never promised, you know, if you become a Christian... Well, you're not gonna. All your life's gonna be hunky dory, roses, rosy, and uh, easy, easy times. Uh, no, he said, just like the person who built their house in the sand, you're going to have the the bad things of life happen. Um, that that's the that's what comes in living in this world. The difference isn't that you will be delivered from all circumstances, from having to experience all circumstances but that you will have a strength from drawing your life from God that in the midst of those tough circumstances, you will be made strong. You will be given, as, as, as Paul heard from God, my grace is sufficient. My power is made perfect in your weakness. I'm not going to take this trial away from you, he told the Apostle Paul, but I'm going to give you the grace to be sustained in it. 
And Jeremiah is saying the same thing. And you find this throughout the Bible. Psalm 23, he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil, my cup overflows. My enemies are there. They're, they're assailing me, but he prepares a table before me. There's an inner feeding on God, an inner strength that's coming from God in the very presence of a world where you know these enemies. Yea, though you even go through the valley of the shadow of death. Uh, we're not going to be delivered from having people we love die and having to go through that experience and, and ultimately of our own death. But what we're promised is that he will be with us. His rod and his staff will comfort us. And here it says, he does not fear, verse 8, when he comes. Uh, Jeremiah is basically telling the people here, it's going to come. Babylon is going to come. I mean, that's what he's been telling them. Judah is going to fall. He's seeing that the great symbol of their nation, the temple that Solomon built, which meant to them more, actually, than the White House and the Capitol mean to us, because for them it was a combination of both their religious belief and their national identity, where the separation of church and state, you know, those things aren't, don't have that religious significance for us. So it, there was even a, a greater sense of the, uh, the sense of dest destruction and abandonment to have that temple destroyed. And he's preparing them. He's basically saying, be ready. If you are someone who is not looking to human beings as your source of strength, but you're looking to God, when this comes, when this thing that I'm saying comes, happens, the heat comes to you, you'll be able to stand because you'll have this thing called faith. Again, my sermon I'm working on for Sunday is the blessing of faith, and I'm thinking about passing our faith on to the children. And I've said this many times, but it bears repeating that when I worked in the hospital, you know, you're a chaplain. And it's very interesting to be a chaplain doing what you do uh, in conjunction with people who are doing what they do as doctors and nurses and social workers. Because doctors and nurses, you know, I mean, they may realize that people have done things and not done things that have brought stuff upon them, you know. I mean, it's true that certain things that you eat and lack of exercise and all kinds of things can lead to heart problems, right, or other kinds of things. But doctors often will have a remedy for that. They'll have a procedure they can do, you know, they can get a stint nowadays if you go in long early enough and i can not all this is just lifestyle related there's genetics and all that involved i'm not but i'm saying you know they'll say you should be doing this and they know people don't often do that but they'll have something they can give a pill some way in which they can help as a minister what a minister wants to tell people is what jeremiah is saying the same thing a doctor is saying and that is you need to be doing what you should be doing every day to maintain your health, and this, in this sense, your spiritual health. You got physical health and you got spiritual health. Because there's going to come a time when you're going to need that spiritual health to sustain you in the midst of a trial, in the midst of the heat, when you get the diagnosis, when the accident happens. You know, I don't like to talk like that, but when you're, when you're in the hospital, you recognize when you get called to the e-room, these things happen to people, you know. They get it. They get the call at night that so and so was, you know, shocking things. And I wish so oftentimes that I could do what the the doctors could do. They could say, "Now here's a pill." I wish I had said, "Now here's a pill, faith." And this faith is going to give you the strength to to, to get through this. Not that you don't experience all the shock and trauma and the horror of the moment but that underlying assurance that you're not alone, that God is with you, that he'll get you through this, no matter what it seems like, and you're going to have the power to, um, to, to face this moment that's greater than yourself. That's the gift of what faith does for you. Now, like as a chaplain, what you're trying to do is be that calming presence and you're kind of trying to be like an, uh, bring a, a good emotional infection, so to speak, and that your own calm, your own 
non-anxious presence is the term they use as in chaplaincy training and things like that, that you go in, you seek to be that calm person they can rely on, and they they get faith from your faith. And, and there is, that does happen, and I'm not saying that, that you can't communicate it that way, and yet it never is the same that when you go into a room of someone who has who has been feeding their faith over the years and they've been putting their trust in God, not in their money. You know, and money's not a bad thing. It's good to have money, right? I mean, someone said money's good if only for financial reasons, right? I mean, it's, it's nice to have those things. But uh, things go up and down, you know. Sometimes I go back and look at my um, retirement account and I look at what happens like around 2008, ooh, there was a huge, huge dip there and it really affected things. And things can change on a dime, you know, and, and if that's what you're building your life on, your health. I mean, we, we can do all we can, but things happen like that. And that's what I say to, to parents when, when they're getting ready to have their child baptized, if they're having their child baptized as an infant, I'll say to them, you know, and the people out here at Salem, they value their children, you know, being prepared for life in the sense of having an education, getting some kind of training, whether it be college or it be a, a trade or some kind of skill, that these be prepared people for life. And it's a great thing. And, uh, and I'll, but I'll say to parents, you know, that's, that's all important. But more important than that is that they be prepared spiritually, that they be fed on the inside, that they be, that they have that relationship with God, so that when the trials of life come, they have a place upon which to stand. And that's that's what he's saying here. That's what happens to the believer. They are like a tree planted by the water. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. It's talking about a life that's planted and grounded in God, and their lives are fruitful. Now, this brings again, and I've mentioned from time to time, the, the, um, the doctrine of, in America, what's called the prosperity gospel. And you hear this from time to time, that in America there is this, there, there have been times when ministers have focused on success in life because that's a that's a great theme in our culture of being successful or or being uh, fulfilled as a person and there is truth to the prosperity gospel in that things don't things don't take a hold unless there's a kernel of truth there that people recognize i mean if it's completely off no one's going to buy it if it has no ring of truth to it and it's the ring of truth is that in general it is true that when your life is grounded in God, as we just read, you bear fruit. And you see this even in their terrible circumstances of being with Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel was someone who bore fruit in a terrible place. Uh, the Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. And so, again, uh, the classic passage for the prosperity gospel is Third John chapter 2, where it says, uh, beloved, I pray above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. And do you hear what that's saying there, that as your soul prospers, there is an effect on one's health. I mean, there's a psychosomatic connection, but it's not... The, wrong, the error of the prosperity gospel is they make it black and white, no ambu amb amb ambiguity and a kind of tit for tat. It's almost like you're doing things to buy God off so that he'll give you these things versus it being the natural organic result. A life isn't prosperous. It is cursed when it's grounded in something outside of God. Not that those people can't be successful and do things, but when the trials of life come, they don't have, they don't have that grounding in God. And it is true that there's an organic blessing 
in being rooted and grounded in God that as your soul prospers, it does often cause people to be in health and to be fruitful in their living, which includes their work life, their focus on on, um, their schoolwork. I see this with my kids now that as they're getting older, you know, when you're younger, maybe we're getting around to some of my kids thinking that mom and dad aren't are actually knew some stuff, you know, when they, they go through that phase where you don't know anything and, and then later on they come back to that. And as they're being out in the world more and more, they see that these Christian principles are the principles by which families are blessed, um, societies are blessed, and so much good happens. No matter what you think about America, America's not a perfect place. Our government has done things that are, are wrong. There is, there's no doubt the, uh, we participate in the sinful human condition. And, uh, and we've been a part of the, the historical process whereby many things now we look back and we say they were way off base to do those things. And yet, in many ways, there were many truly biblical, God-given um, ways of living that shaped many of the, the very devout people who were members of the society, and they influenced other aspects of the society. Maybe they weren't very Christian, but they just kind of were people who did what everyone else did, and, and this is how you did. And a lot of, um, you can see a lot of the abundance here in America does come out of living in the way God meant for us to live. Now, I'm not saying again that America was perfect or that God just... Um, but I'm, I'm also not saying that, that, uh, that God arbitrarily blessed America. The, the, the patterns we see in the Bible like this are not arbitrary. They're saying this is the way the world works. And so that brings me to another point here is that there are times when people are almost ashamed that, and, and have a hard time with the fact that we live as such blessed people in this country. And I think um, part of that is, not, is unfounded because God is the one who made the world such that it, it can be a place where you bring forth much fruit and that he rejoices in seeing the prosperity of people and that his will is not that everyone would be poor, but his will is, is, that, is that that prosperity would be known by more and more people. But we are reminded that we're really standing on, on the shoulders of the people who went before us, and every generation has to reclaim those patterns of life. And again, America has been a place where people have been more shaped by the message of the Bible than in any other place in the world, because this was a place in which a religion became, was something that flowed from a personal decision to believe. He didn't belong to the state church, which we're getting to that, because he's talking, remember, earlier about the heart, and that it's through an inner change of one's heart that one lives the way that God has them to live, which is bringing us to the next verse. The heart is deceitful above all things, and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Now, here's what Jeremiah is bringing up here, which is, I think, Again, another interesting thing here is here he, he's making it, it seems so simple and, and straightforward and plain. Follow God's ways, and for the most part, you will be blessed. It's not saying that bad things don't happen to good people or whatever the book, you know, title was. But for the most part, as your soul prospers, so it affects you, it affects your family, it affects your work life. And there is a, a general flourishing of your life. And you would think then that people would just say, hey, let's go for it. Let's live the way that leads to flourishing. I mean, it just if it's so common sense, uh, go for it. And so Jeremiah basically is pointing out the reason why what should be so obvious to people isn't followed. He says, the heart is deceitful above all things, and beyond cure. 
the word, and this is from one of my um, sources that I studied, they have the word for this is, let me find, I'm going to find the exact quote if I can, although my software here is acting funny. Mortally sick. I, I, my software is acting up, but the quote is basically mortally sick. The, the, the Hebrew here is that of, of, of being deathly sick. This is describing what later on will be called in theology the depravity of humanity. In our church's little doctrine book that we use to teach the children with, it, it brings up the state of human beings uh, in, the, in the light of sin. And this is what it says. Let me find it here. I had it open. It says, what is man's condition since the fall? The fall is our being disconnected from God as a race. Since the fall, man is not prepared to do good, but inclined to do evil. This inherited corruption is called original sin. Um, this inherited corruption... This is one of those verses that teaches what we call original sin. And that when I say America has been blessed because of the Christians who have been here, who have influenced and pushed society to act a certain way, is because the Christians are people who have been enlightened to the truth and that you actually need enlightenment because without that enlightenment, you're, as we say, it says in this little doctrine book, you're inclined to go the wrong way. Even though it's as plain as day, it should be, we've, we've got this bent that keeps pushing us to go away from our own best interests. Uh, in, the, in the New Testament, it will speak of our human nature as the flesh or the sinful nature. And the way I try to describe this to people is it's you can't even trust your own humanity. Your own humanity works against your own best interests. And uh, where, where this doctrine first comes about is in the early stories of Genesis. You know, the stories of Genesis are of people being disconnected from God, and then it describes the downward spiral and what humanity is like because of this disconnection from God. And so, uh, uh, if you turn to Genesis 6, just before the flood, it says in chapter 6, verse 5, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. This is a description of human nature. Now, it's not very popular to speak that way, but Jeremiah is basically saying there's a reason why we keep messing up as Israel. There's a reason why having been told over and over and over again the way that leads to prosperity. I mean, you look at America and people do worry about our country that are we going to throw off the ways that have worked? You know, Again, this hasn't been a perfect country. I'm not claiming that. It's not a sinless country. But a lot of it has worked really well, right? I mean, we have known an unprecedented way of life. And yet there's a real fear that that could be lost. And you think, well, how in the world would a people abandon something that has brought so much blessing to them? And from Jeremiah's perspective, it's because the human heart is, is deceived and, and, it, and, and it's inclined to go. It's like when uh, uh, one of my professors in seminary described the human as a, like a Rolls Royce that has been in an accident and is now going the wrong direction. It, it, it's, off, it's all out of alignment. It's still a Rolls Royce. It's still an amazing creation, and yet it's, it's, it's skewed. It's going the wrong way. And he was trying to say that, yes, human beings are depraved, but they're still amazing creations, right? They're, they're more incredible than the Rolls Royce. But like a Rolls Royce that's been damaged, the human condition is one of damagedness. Fallenness is the technical language. The damages of, of being disconnected from God, and it's led to a bentness away from our own best interests. And the way it was described in Genesis is the every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart are only evil all the time. That's before the flood. 
Then after the flood, God looks out at um, human beings and he says, never again, this is chapter 8 after Noah gives the, uh, a sweet-smelling sacrifice to God, God says, never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. Chapter 6, it's all the time that humans are inclined to evil. Chapter 8, it's from childhood. And so when our little doctrine book here says that man is not prepared to do good, but inclined to do evil, it's like not making that up, you know. That's a belief that has its grounding in the Bible, in these early stories that are trying to describe the human condition alienated from God. It's a human condition that's become inclined to evil all the time, Genesis 6, even from childhood. This is what we mean by original sin or having a, a sinful human nature, and that one of our enemies, there are three enemies, the world, the devil, and the flesh, our own human nature is one of our enemies. These are the three things we battle as Christians, the world, the flesh, and the devil. We don't, we don't battle against mortal human beings in the sense they're not our enemy. The world is the way the world thinks. We don't battle against people. Our battle is not against flesh and blood in that sense, but flesh as in our own human nature that's working against us. So the answer, he says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Then 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind. The answer for Jeremiah is having a relationship with God. How can you know what's right? As you need to be, ultimately, you need to be born again. The Bible will say you'll need to be, you need to be spiritually awakened and enlightened and given a new nature. And indeed, that if you saw in our reading that it's going to talk, and later on in Jeremiah, uh, in our outline, it was talking about how in Jeremiah 30, God is going to bring this new covenant, and he's going to change Israel's heart. And that's, that's the answer. Um, let's see if I can find that exact passage. And th this is the... Um, yeah. This is the covenant. This is Jeremiah 31, 33, the answer that's found in Jeremiah. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, after this time of Nebuchadnezzar coming down, destruction of their temple, the failure of the people. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. It's, this is where he's talking about a new covenant. He's predicting a time, and this is the time we believe that is fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus is picking up the theme of this new covenant when he's giving us communion and everything. And when he tells his disciples in John's gospel that the spirit who's been with them is going to be in them. And that spirit that's going to come into them, he's going to write on their hearts. God's laws, and he's going to move them. Ezekiel's going to say the same thing as he's speaking of a coming day when he's going to give us this gift of a new heart, we who have this, this reality of a sinful nature. But the way it's working itself out is that we have this spirit that's coming into us. It's beginning to change us and to transform us. And as it's doing that, it's, it's beginning the process of undoing our sinful nature in the sense of transforming us. It's a, it's a process of becoming more and more transformed by having this presence in our lives of the, of the presence of God called the Holy Spirit, guiding and directing our lives and leading us away from that way of the inclinations to evil. So Paul will say to the Colossians, put to death what remains of your earthly nature. So he, he says to the, to the Christian, there remains in you th that which you participate in the human condition, that condition described 
before and after the flood. But you have to, and the way I always see putting to death is, is you don't give in to that part of your human nature that would lead you away from God. You give in to those new inclinations that are being born in you through the presence of God in your life, through the word about Jesus that you're listening to, and the presence of God through that word about Jesus moving you in the in the new direction, doing in you what what Jeremiah said would come true and be in you. That's the answer, this covenant uh, that he will make with them at that time when he puts uh, the spirit, when he puts the, the, the law in their minds and writes it in their heart. He says, no longer, verse 34 of chapter 31, will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Lo, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least to the greatest. See, that's really what we're celebrating, you might say, at this time, uh, the Sundays after Epiphany, we're celebrating the knowledge of God that's come to everybody through Jesus, that everyone can have an understanding and knowledge of God and have God in their lives, that this prophecy of, of Jeremiah will come true. It goes on to say, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Well, of course, that's what happens to us in Jesus Christ. And, uh, and this has been fulfilled in him. And, and that's what we're celebrating, that we can have our lives be guided. But that should help us understand then, again, when we're going into the world, we're dealing with people who are dead in their trespasses and sins, as the Bible says, and they need to be made alive. They have a heart that's inclining them to go against what's best for them. And it's only to the degree that their culture has been shaped by the truth that they just kind of go along with the crowd and it makes for a good society. But the fewer and fewer people who are woke in the real sense of being woke, which is being awake in the spirit, being awakened in Christ to your true, the true way of being, it's only to the degree that that, that process of spiritual life, of being born again, is happening in a society that you have that renewing power for a society to be planted in God and planted in his ways that lead to the ways of life. And Jeremiah is all about that. It's all about to be, to be a, a Christian, as we see it later on, because a Christian is to, to experience the fulfillment of his promises in Jeremiah 31, is to be like that one who is blessed. And I mentioned that this should remind you of, of a psalm, and that's actually Psalm 1, the very psalm that sets off the, the, the theme of the psalms. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the streams of living water, which yields its fruit in a season, his leaf does not wither, and whatever he doeth shall prosper. But the wicked are not so. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. You hear how that sounds? That just is saying, it's not, it's saying this is the natural result. It's like being planted in that salty area south of the Dead Sea. There's no, nothing to draw life from there. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor are sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. So we have the great answer to the human problem, and that is the preaching of the gospel. And this is where I want to end, because this is what we're talking about Sunday with our Christian education program, is what are we trying to do? We're trying to share the gospel with our children, with the members of our church, in the belief that that when they hear it and when it gets inside of them, when they're like that good soil, and Jesus is saying, and they're not like the hardened path and that they're not letting it in, and they're not distracted like the one who has the weeds that come chokes it out. But when we have those times when someone really hears the message and it gets inside of them, it comes alive in them, and they become truly woke in the real sense of being truly convicted about their own human nature, they recognize the deceitfulness of the sinful nature of the flesh, their heart, and they start to see for the first time in a real, alive way how they should be living. 
It's the way that's in Jesus Christ. They're alive to him. They want what he has, and they want that life that he has. And then he motivates them because he's writing it on their heart. He's on the inside of them. And they begin to walk in the paths that lead to life. And yes, then they become salt and light to the society and to the degree that they're shaping the culture. They'll, they'll, people who just go along for the ride will join them and it'll make for a better society in general. But uh, the goal and the desire is that all people would come to this knowledge of, of the truth in salvation, which is the gift that Jeremiah prophesied would come when God would make that new covenant, what we call the New Testament in Jesus Christ, a new relationship made possible through him. So that's the book of Jeremiah 17, 5 through 10. Let's end with a quick prayer. Father, we thank you for this study tonight, for the opportunity to to study your word and to let it come into our lives. And we do pray, Lord, that you would use this church, that you would use other churches to sow the seed of the word of God in the next generation, that they would be made alive in you and that you would fulfill what you said would happen through Jeremiah in them, that they would experience the law written on their hearts and on their minds, the cure to the sinful heart, that they would experience being made spiritually alive, as Peter said, through the living and abiding word of God, they would be born again, made renew in you. And we thank you for the promise that as we live in your ways, and as our soul prospers, it will, in, in fact, I- I- impact uh, the whole of life. So uh, we, we want that, and we desire it, and we pray for it, Lord. We recognize that we can't have your blessing if we're not walking in your ways. We pray for our country, Lord. Our country can't know the blessing that we've known if we stray from the ways that lead to life. It's not arbitrary. It's the way the world is. It's the way it works. And we pray for, uh, for that to happen, and we know that the way it can happen is through a renewal of your people, the church. And we pray these things, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine down upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.